These are things that we amateurs learn the first month of using our Seastar S50. First off, this device is a great tool to use to start a new hobby. Relatively inexpensive and all-inclusive to get started. It included all of the tripod, the everything you needed to get started. We love it and encourage anyone thinking about getting one to do so. These are just some of the thoughts that we had after we used it for a month. First off, it's easy to set up, but uh, there's a few quirky things like the leveling. Leveling can be tricky and a pain if you're using the tripod, the tripod and it's close to the ground. It's a lot of bending over to adjust it and to calibrate it. To loosen the legs and expand them is a little awkward when the top heavy device is sitting on top. And so those are some things that we found a little inconvenient. Uh, when using the sun filter, don't forget to take it off before you close the arm. It can make the arm get stuck and unable to open. And the way we found this out is we luckily had this happen to us. Um, I had it happen and I was really nervous that I'd have to break the arm to get it open because it, it just made it kind of wedge into the device and then the arm was kind of stuck. Luckily it was easily resolved without any problems, but I can see how it could quickly become a devastating issue. Uh, the C-Star is easy to move around by just picking it up by the tripod, but be careful because lifting it this way, it's top heavy. So you pick it up off the ground and it, it wobbles around a little bit in your hand. So it could be easy to drop or to bang into walls or door frames. It could also easily swivel and loosen on the tripod screw and come loose if you aren't careful. So those are some things to be careful with. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the battery life. The internal battery runs for several hours on the new machine and it's great. It does use more battery if you use the dew protector heater, um, but it still lasts for several hours. Uh, we've never depleted the battery life on it. Uh, we have opted to use a portable battery charger pack that we use for like charging our cell phones out on hikes and things. It works great and keeps the internal battery at 100% uh, for several hours. In fact, we've never had it go below 100% while having it attached to that power bank. The power bank will drain, but the internal battery of the device doesn't, hasn't. And we run it for about six hours approximately, and it's never depleted the battery pack and the internal battery. The battery icon in the app, it changes colors. And I'm guessing this info is probably in the instructions somewhere, but instructions are for sissies, you know. So I haven't read about it. Um, I'm really just kidding. But the green battery icon displays how much internal battery life is remaining. When the sea star drops to a low temperature outside, the icon turns blue. And I believe the instructions say it won't charge from a battery pack when it's blue, but ours has been charging. While we haven't noticed any differences with the color change, we can use the color of the battery icon to clue us in to the Sea Star being cold or needing to turn on the dew heater. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about the sun, moon, and planets options. Sometimes the Sea Star has a hard time finding the sun. Uh, we tried all the calibrations, the compass calibration, but it still sometimes is a little finicky. And the manual controls are a little bit hard to use to actually find the sun because you don't know which direction you need to go. Um, practicing with the manual controls by using um, an object and manually moving it around just to see how it works can help. Uh, they can uh, move things different ways than you think they will too. So I found it's easier to turn up the brightness and use the light changes to find the sun an easier way if the auto finding didn't work. And it's usually right at the beginning where it, it goes to the sun and then it starts its little process of trying to find it where it's closest to it. So sometimes just cancel it there and then use the manual functions. Sometimes it's frustrating and can take me up to an hour to find the sun. It would be great if the screen would open the camera so you could pan around and see where you're looking, but it's not quite that straightforward. The sun filter, it's not very durable. And while luckily we haven't damaged ours, I could see that it could be easy to put a finger through that filter. So be careful when you're removing it from the container or from the Sea Star itself. 
The moon is a little bit easier to find than the sun, but it can also frequently miss the moon on the first attempts. And the reason we found it's easier is if we can focus the telescope on a different night sky object, and then it will do all its internal calibrations, and that seems to help it find out where it's at. And then the next time we try to go to the moon, it actually finds it. Um, so that can make it a little easier just because we have other things to point to to calibrate it. Uh, the planets, don't plan on them being very identifiable straight off the sea star. They look like fuzzy dots of light. I know there are others who use post-processing and eventually get something like the planet should look, but who knows how actually real those are or natural. Is it a real image off the sea star at that point, or is it a generated image off of Photoshop? I don't know. That's for individuals to decide. Uh, as for convenience, some things we didn't even think about before buying the smart telescope that were realized after the fact. These are obvious, and you're going to think, well, duh, but these things are... Well, there isn't always a good day to view things on the day that you want to do the imaging. Clouds happen, fog happens, neighbors' lights happen, cars drive by. Of course, this is obvious, but it's surprising how many times we notice these distractions now. And it's surprising how many weekends or days that we have time to do this. It's stormy. To gather a lot of stacking images also takes a long time. We've only had our sea star for a month and barely cracked the code on some images in terms of exposure time. This gives us hope that some of the barely viewable objects have potential, but as people describe it as a point and shoot, it's not really a point and shoot and print the final image. This is not a Hubble telescope. While it's a powerful tool for the backyard amateur astronomer, it's not going to produce every image in fabulous glory right off the machine. When I saw images of, on some groups of incredible objects and thought, oh man, I want to do that one, I forgot to take into consideration that the object isn't available in my night sky at any given time. So if I want to image an object tonight, it may not rise above my horizon until 4 a.m. or until summertime. Or nightly imaging isn't always possible. I had big plans of imaging all of the phases of the moon. Well, some nights were cloudy and invisible, some were foggy and hazy, then the phase began, the moon rose at 5 p.m., but now a few weeks later the moon is rising to my visibility at 2.30 a.m., making for long nights and early rising to do scheduled imaging. My plan is to take the telescope out to a darker area for better imaging. Well, that will mean a lot of sitting in my car as it takes 10 second exposures over time. Plan for something to do during this waiting time with a battery pack for your phone or your laptop too. Uh, imaging expectations. Well, some of the images we take using the Seastar S50 are fabulous right from the first saved exposure, and some are not. So, for example, the Orion Nebula is huge, brilliant, and highly visible right from the first exposure. The Dumbbell Nebula is good, too. Even the Andromeda Galaxy appears within the first few exposures and is identifiable. Well, that's not always the case. The majority of objects are either invisible or a pinpoint fuzzy dot for long periods of time. While doing the Orion Nebula was thrilling as one of my first images, it did give me a false sense of expectations. As I lowered the bar a bit after some experience with our other objects, I would suggest new Sea Star owners either avoid the highly visible objects or at least have a realistic expectation of what the majority of objects really look like. Some, even after an hour of stacking image, are barely visible. These would take more patience and expertise in post-processing. As for post-processing, there's a huge learning curve with this, one that we certainly haven't perfected. There are a lot of options for software for post-processing. Some are free and some are expensive. Some are user-friendly while others might need a master's degree to use. Results can be varied and care must be taken to save the original so it will do some. If you do some editing that you end up not liking, it's easy to go back to either the original or undo the actions. What you may like, others may not. This is normal and we all know this, but be careful not to let others' opinions discourage you or even hurt your feelings. Some may like the highly edited images that barely look realistic, while others only like them to look natural and as close to reality as possible. 
Over processing may look good on your computer screen, but it won't always look great on a bigger screen. Ask us how we know. We are loving our new little toy, and while everything hasn't gone smoothly and perfectly, we are learning new things and enjoying every minute of our new hobby. Join us in our journey and share your suggestions for newbies in the comments so we can learn more of what we didn't know that we didn't know.